Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's been a wild couple of years. We have been apart for a while. And what is it, 2021 or 2020? They all run together with this pandemic. But the last time we talked, we talked to Patrick Persley, an Illinois exoneree who spent 25 years in prison for a homicide he didn't commit. He was doing a life bit for first degree murder when ballistics testing showed his gun was not used in the crime. He was wrongfully convicted and, and now is an exoneree. Speaking of exonerees, speaking of wrongful convictions, convicting a murderer, the 10 part rebuttal to making a murderer is out. The first four episodes are streaming now on Daily Wire Plus. And we couldn't be happier about that to bring this here uh, today to bring the program back online. So just fair disclosure, though, I have a small role in convicting a murderer. If you've seen the first four episodes, I may, my antidotes are sprinkled in the first three, I believe uh, three of the first uh, four. Uh, but I'm in the rest uh, here and there, and I've seen the rest. And we are going to talk about today what is going on. Why did they make this docu-series to tarnish Stevie Avery's name? That's the question. Actually, that's the claim. The truthers, the guilters are still at war online. And of course, the claim is uh, among Avery supporters is that this is a piece of trash and that Candace Owens is fronting something just to um, tarnish Stephen Avery's name. But let's jump right in. And we are going to discuss how convicting a murderer is going to prove to you, if you're on the fence, if you're somebody who or, or maybe an ardent supporter of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey. I don't know. But it's going to show that Teresa Halbach died on that on Avery's, Avery property, just like the state said. It's going to show that making a murderer not only left out aspects of the trial, aspects of the evidence, but it did so to dupe millions of people into believing that Avery and Dassey were framed. So let's jump right in. What happened? Is this docu-series meant to tarnish Stephen Avery's name? Or, as the docu-series shows in the first, two or, uh, the first uh, three episodes, that Stephen Avery had a well-documented history of of abuse. And of course, we are talking about the, uh, you throw in the, the cat. Now the cat is interesting, right? You know, Avery mitigates his responsibility for the cat, you know, first by telling MAM fil filmmakers that the cat, that he threw the cat in the fire, you know, he just, he just kind of did it and it went up in flames. It wasn't really that big of a deal, right? And he tells his mother though, that someone named Jerry actually did it. Jerry Yonda, I believe. And he took the blame because of course, Avery was on you know, probation. And of course, this was just a way for making a murderer to show that little Stevie was the target. He was just a loving man to a loving man who couldn't get a break. He was a loving family man, right? Except the, except for the times that he, he did all this stuff. And the burglaries and the break-ins and the things like that. Attack on Avery's character. No, these, these types of, these types of, this type of information rather about someone's character, a defendant in a criminal investigation are usually, almost always um, dug up by investigators and the, the prosecutors do whatever they can to, to show these types of uh, character traits in trials. A lot of times defense attorneys will suppress this type of, uh, th this type of evidence and they, they make legal arguments to do that. So you can't fault either side. So let's look at what's going on. So you decide, watch the first couple of episodes of convicting a murderer and you decide, compare them to making a murderer and you will see that making a murderer did whatever they could to make Stephen Avery the most sympathetic character that they could possibly make him out to be in order to set up the st set the stage for this, this, this framing defense. And they weave in the 1985 case to show that everybody was against Stevie Avery from the start because they framed him in 85 and now they're doing it again. But the, again, this is going to show you if you do the research yourself, like all of you say you have, juxtapose both docuseries or actually look at the case files and the, and the investigations against Stephen Avery and put them to the test against the docu-series, and you will see that making a murder is just a, a piece of fiction. 
All right, let's jump into episode four and the answering machine message, the famous answering machine message. If you haven't watched uh, Convicting a Murderer episode four, go ahead and do that. Um, if you want to wait till we talk here to do so, that's fine with me because we are going to talk about how this cell tower data, Teresa Hallbox, phone records, and this answering machine message left on Barb Toddick. I'm going to call her Barb Toddick. That's Brendan Dassey's mother. She was Barb uh, uh, Janda at the time. This answering machine message left on her uh, answering machine by uh, Teresa Hallbach has caused a lot of trouble, but the truth is going to is going to rear its head. And like I said, this is just one piece. This is the introduction to the moment that convicting a murderer is going to show you again that Teresa Halbach never left the Avery property on October 31st, 2005. All these theories are nonsense. Teresa Halbach died on that property on October 31st, 2005. Convicting a murderer proves it. And it starts with with this stuff, this, the cell tower data. Now, th there is a lot of confusion because Kathleen Zellner filed this huge motion, this 1,200-page motion, um, her first motion where she, where she claims Ryan Hillegas and Scott Bladorn were the, probably the killers and all of this types of stuff. And it confused a lot of people, including some of us in the media, who were confused by some of this cell phone data um, just because there was a lot of it. And the, the, the state claimed uh, one thing at trial and Zellner's claiming something else. But let's talk about the cell phone data. Now, the state's report shows that Teresa made a call to Auto Trader customer Stephen Schmitz in New Holstein, Wisconsin at 12.51 p.m. Now, before that, at what the state showed at 11.43, she left that message. This is the message she left, or he, she left for, Barb's, for Barb Janda, Stephen Avery's sister, because she did not have the address. If you listen to this, you heard Teresa Hallbach say very clearly that I did not have the address. In making a murderer, that part is cut off. That part is cut off intentionally. Because making a murderer does not want you to, 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 to believe, as the jury did, that Teresa Halbach met her demise on the Avery property. They want you to believe that she left there and went to George and Joellen Zipperer's house and then was killed somewhere else and her remains brought back to the Avery salvage yard. And that's, that's the theory that Kathleen Zellner has been floating for year, floated in her 1,200-page um, initial motion, and she's still floating it today. Now, Halbach did not initially make the connection to Avery because he used a fake name, he, a B. Janda. But she came to realize later that she had visited Avery several times. She knows Avery. And the calls that, that were placed earlier here, 12.51 p.m. and 11.43 a.m., these calls, the first call to Barb Janda and the second call to Stephen Schmitz, pinged a cell phone tower in the town of Hilbert near the home of Teresa and Scott Bladorn. She was probably at home getting ready for the day, leaving the house, something like that, or, or close to it. Now, Smith testified that Halbach photographed his car at 1.30. At 1.52, Halbach received a call that pinged a tower in Whitelaw, Wisconsin, about 12 miles from Avery's salvage yard. There was also a 2.12 call and a 2.13 p.m. call. Both calls serviced were serviced by Sector 3 of Tower 2192 in Mishicot. Now, that indicates that Teresa Halbach was traveling towards where? Avery Auto Salvage in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. Now, this is where the confusion comes in. 
And this is where Kathleen Zellner has has wanted millions of Making a Murderer fans out there to believe that Teresa Halbach left the property after taking a picture of Barb's van. And the, the, the possibility that she could have uh, been at, at Zipperer's house after Avery's um, seemed to be uh, plausible in the making of, in the documentary. But in reality, it's completely debunked and a and complete lie. It's a lie. According to Stephen Avery's uh, 2016 affidavit, Halbach, like he has claimed, took a picture of his sister's van at 231 and then left. Joellen Zipperer initially told police that Halbach came to her home to photograph her grandson's car between 2 and 2.30 p.m., but wasn't sure. That was evident when she testified it could have been as late as 3.30. Mrs. Zipperer reverted to her original statement when Ken Kratz refreshed her memory by showing her the signed statement she provided to Calumet County investigator John Dietering on November 6, 2005. Zipperer said she saw Halbach head away from her house on foot, but she did not see her drive away. So what does that tell us? What it tells us is that Halbach was making phone calls between 2 and 2.13 p.m. and was moving towards the Avery Salvage Yard coming from the Zipperers. Making a murderer knew that. The Making a Murderer filmmakers knew that and they did not put it in the documentary because had they done that, it would have gone along with the state's theory because the state extrapolated this information and presented it clearly to the jury. Again, I'm going to tell you that this case was huge. It was sensational. Again, I'll reiterate that, but it was not huge and sensational because Teresa Halbach or because Stephen Avery was framed. It was big and sensational because you had Stephen Avery, the poster child for exonerations, and his 16-year-old nephew accused of rape, murder, and mutilating a 25-year-old woman. That's why it was huge. It was a big case on par with the Jeffrey Dahmer homicide cases. The, 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 the many victims he had, the, cannibal, uh, the cannibalism, and how that uh, just... Uh, uh, sent horrific shockwaves through the entire state, the entire country, really. This, this case was on pace with that, not because they were framed. And these filmmakers knew it. And this is just, again, this is just the tip, or excuse me, we're just, we're just scratching the surface, folks. Episode four shows a very, very big, small but big piece of information that was clipped from that answering machine message. Because they did not want you to know that Stephen Avery lured Teresa Halbach to his property, property owned by his family, so he could proposition her for sex. However, what we are left with is the aftermath of millions and millions of duped viewers who were under the impression they were watching a truthful production. Now, and I'll just say this now, the, the most common response I get from people, uh, you, know, I, you know, I see these comments online and I talk to people about making a murderer and, and that is how furious they were after they watched that docuseries. You know, they were furious with the cops and the prosecutors for framing Avery and, da Avery and Dassey. And I'm just going to tell you, my response is, well, if that truly happened, we all should be furious. We should be very furious. But you can take a deep breath, everybody. You can relax because none of this happened. Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey were not framed. They were not targeted. And Making a Murderer was one of the most egregious pieces of pseudo-journalism that I've ever seen. Convicting a Murderer, Daily Wire Plus. Episodes 1 through 4 are now streaming. Episode 5 will drop at midnight Thursday. 
Until then, I am Jim Haggerty. We're brought to you by CityTrib.com. We will see you next time. And in the meantime, look it up because it's all on Al Gore's internet.